Let's pray before we dive into God's word. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have spoken to us. You have not left us as a people without counsel. That is counsel we can read in your word, uh, which becomes alive and engages us through the power of your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we pray today um, that as we talk about alcohol and drunkenness, um, and each of us have our own presuppositions of what might happen and what the effects might be, that you would be gracious and kind to bring us to a place of seeing all of this as you would have us to see it and to be responsible with what you've given us to be responsible. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together. Bless our time and our fellowship. We pray this in your name. Amen. So if you've been at Sovereign Hope for a considerable period of time, you've probably noticed that there are kind of three key areas uh, that which the Bible causes to shape our culture and our mission and our church. And the first is that we are a a theologically conservative and reformed church. And that's to say we believe in the inerrancy of scripture, that this isn't God's guidebook that quickly became outdated, but this is the word of God. And that God is a big God, a strong God, a God who can save dead sinners like ourselves. And so we're a church that looks into God's word before we look out into our culture. But then culturally and missionally, we are evangelical, which is far more than simply a political term. When we talk about evangelicalism, we don't identify with a system of politics, though there are political beliefs inside of it. We identify with what scripture calls the church to be, that we are an evangelistic people, that the gospel which saves us is the gospel which saves all sinners. And we have a responsibility to call people to Jesus and go to the nations with the gospel of Jesus. That what we believe in private must shape how we live, act, and talk in public. And we find this commission in Jesus' great commission to the church in the gospel of Matthew. In order to fulfill that mission, when it comes to identity as a church, we are a Baptistic church. We believe that the Bible calls for confessing believers to profess faith in Jesus, to be baptized by immersion, identifying with his death, burial, and resurrection, and to gather into local churches, which God, through his Holy Spirit, equips with spiritual gifts to love each other, grow each other, and be faithful to the mission that God has given to his churches across the globe until Jesus comes to rule and reign forever. And if you were to tell your neighbors that you go to a conservative, reformed, evangelical, baptistic church, I can promise you that your neighbors have a presupposition about what we talk about and how we live. And as we've been working through the book of Proverbs, we've been 32 weeks so far in the book of Proverbs, we have walked right into many of those presuppositions. So far, there have been three primary categories of sin that, the, that Solomon has come back to time and time again. I don't know if you've picked up on those, but those three are the glutton, the adulterer, the one who has any sex outside of marriage, and the drunkard. And for some reason, when people think about the church or think about token sins of the church, they glance over gluttony, which shouldn't happen. Because what we see when we look at gluttony, when we look at sexuality, and when we look at drunkenness, we clearly see that God cares about the bodies of his people. That is not merely an isolated set of ideas that only affects our spirituality, but our spirituality shapes our physicality and how we live and act. And so even when it comes to how we eat, God cares about that. Because it represents a lack of self-control and sobriety, even in chicken wings, as much as it does in whiskey or in sex. And yet, there is the stereotype and the caricature of a Christian people constantly talking about the dangers of sex, drugs, drinking, and rock and roll. And so if you were to go to your neighbor, your average Missoulian neighbor, and tell them that you go to a conservative evangelical Baptist church, and in two consecutive weeks you've now talked about sexuality and drunkenness, they would probably not at all be aghast. Instead, they would say, that seems about right. And yet, this is why Proverbs is so beautiful. Because it disrupts all of our presuppositions and forms it with the wisdom of God. You see, when we look at Proverbs as a whole, while time and time again, Solomon warns us of gluttony, he also presents the wisdom of God as honey which we are called to eat indulgently and be satisfied. 
While Solomon warns of sex outside of marriage, he calls husbands and wives in a really awkward text to preach, and we did, to stagger together in sexual intimacy. And calls all of us, whether we are married or single, to find that intimacy by coming to wisdom, being wed to God through Jesus Christ. And he talks about drunkenness. And today we're going to see a text that warns of drunkenness. And yet, Proverbs 3 verse 10, God says that he rewards the wise man with vats bursting with wine. We live in a world that only wants absolutes. And the book of Proverbs will not let us be that. The book of Proverbs wants you not to make difficult decisions, but to make constant wise choices. It's calling you in every circumstance to look at what is difficult, but to realize it needs to be infused with God's wisdom, with the clarity to see things how God calls us to see them. Proverbs doesn't simply tell us to use food, sex, and alcohol however we see fit. That goes beyond what Proverbs is talking about. But neither does it tell us that we should always and only abstain from food, alcohol, and sex. Both extremes miss the wisdom of God, which tells, tells us that we need to enjoy all of these in submission to the one who created it. And that is where we find the good life. Instead, whether we eat or drink or whether we don't, Solomon wants Christians to see that these things are not from the world. They do not belong to the world. They are gifts from God given to his people to be held in submission to him and enjoyed as he prescribes it and not abused using them for purposes and ends which God never designed them to be used for. Today as we talk about alcohol, Solomon wants us to see how the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's the good news that Jesus did everything required to save sinners and restore us to God shapes how we view alcohol. Our relationship with Jesus changes our relationship towards alcohol. In other words, and this is our main point today, knowing God's wisdom changes what we know about alcohol and how we use it. Or to use the analogy that Solomon's going to use, it changes how we see alcohol and how we use it. And we're going to see this in three ways today. First, we're going to really drill down into our text today, which is Proverbs 23, verses 29 through 35. And in that, we're going to see alcohol in the context of wisdom. What is Solomon telling us about alcohol in this particular text? And what we're going to see is it is a drastic warning. But then we're going to look at the narrative of Scripture. And there, we're going to see alcohol in the context of the gospel. And then lastly, in light of everything God's word says to us, the decision comes to us as God's people and we look at alcohol in the context of the church. How does God's view of alcohol shape how we view and use alcohol? While we all have thoughts on these issues and those thoughts dictate how we consume and what we don't consume, Solomon wants today more than anything you to have a biblical view of alcohol and of drunkenness. We live in a state here in Montana It has the third highest breweries per capita in the country, which is to say that we need to be sure that what is passively already in our homes and in our workplaces and in our cities is spoken to by God's objective truth, that we are not passively carried along by what seems to be normal, but we participate in that to the level that God's word calls us to. And we've defined wisdom in the book of Proverbs, not simply as street smarts or being an uberkind or knowing the quadratic equation, which I used to know. Now I don't. I know it's a thing. But wisdom is seeing the world through God's eyes. That is to see the world as it truly is. And only seeing Jesus allows us to see that. Only seeing Jesus opens our eyes to see our brokenness and see God's beauty, and it shapes everything. And in this text today, Solomon's going to invite us to see alcohol through God's eyes by holding before our eyes the dangers of drunkenness. One theologian calls this passage the drunkard's looking glass. It is Solomon holding up the mirror to the person who is blind to their own heart so they might see the current state they are in. In many ways, as we read this text today, we're going to see that Solomon wants to inebriate us. He wants to inebriate us, not with drunkenness, but actually with the folly of drunkenness, that we would be staggered 
by the foolishness of a life ruled by alcohol. And part of, we're in a part of Proverbs that begun in the 30 sayings of the wise, a, a chapter and a half ago, where Solomon is preparing young adults to go out into the world and he wants to equip them with a sober picture. And so there are young adults in here. There are kids in here. There's opportunities in high school and in college and perhaps even before to lay hold of alcohol, how you see fit. And there are others in here who are older who have already done that. But here we all come. Solomon is giving us the grace of speaking to us in advance and warning us. And what you'll notice as we go through this text is Solomon begins by talking in the abstract. He begins with the question, who is the one? It could be anyone. Who is it? And in the next section, he shifts into the second person. He says, you are the one who will see strange things. And then at the end, if you heard Stephen read, it goes into the first person. It says, when will I awake for I must have another drink? Solomon intentionally brings this passage from what is obscure to what is deeply personal. So as if to say to you, regardless of what your thoughts are today, this could be you without God's grace. This could be you if you neglect his wisdom in this passage. And it's in light of this that Solomon wants to show us, which is our first point today, alcohol in the context of wisdom. So this is our our first point. We're going to look at this in verse 29 of chapter 23. And here, I don't know how many of you played Guess Who when you were kids, where you say, does he have a hat? Does she have earrings? And you flip down the little things to decide who it is. Solomon's going to do that with us in a series of questions. And let's look at those questions in verse 29 together. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? And so what we know, if we just look at verse 29, Solomon doesn't give us the answer in verse 29, but we know that whoever is the subject of verse 29 is not someone to be envied. This person has problems in every aspect of life. They are emotionally distraught with woe and sorrow. The Hebrew words behind that is is literally they are exclaiming their woe. They are distressed. We see that they are broken relationally. Their lives are filled with conflict and strife. It ruins the relationships they have and disrupts the community they live in. And then lastly, there's a physical ramification where this person has wounds, they can't tell you how they got, and their eyes are swollen and red with dehydration. And think of this as the world's first Jeopardy game. The category is Fantastic Follies, and the Alec Trebek of the ancient Near East reads the prompt. He says, this person is characterized by internal turmoil, destroys functional relationships, and has a body that is wasting away. And Solomon, the greater Ken Jennings, buzzes in, and he says, what is, Proverbs 23, 30, those who tarry long over wine, those who go to try mixed wine. Who is this woeful person? Who is this person whose life is completely derailed? The one who tarries long over wine and is constantly looking to make the alcohol more palatable so that he might drink more and more and more. So what does it mean to tarry? It means to to hesitate. It means to linger, to stick around just a little bit longer than you probably should have. How many of you have answered a phone call from an unknown number and said hello, and you hear the pause? I call it the pause of doom. Because if you've done this before, you know what's happening. You've just been auto-called by a computer for a telemarketing company, and the computer heard you answer, and now it's taking a moment to connect you to the representative who's going to talk to you about your car's extended warranty. And what you do when you hear that pause is you do not tarry. You begin to wish you had an old phone with tangible buttons, and you're trying to unlock your phone, and it's black, and then it's on, and it's black, and it's on, and you're trying to press the button, and hopefully you're able to turn it off. But sometimes, have you guys had a number from, or call from a number that has a 406 area code? It seems like maybe I should know this number, and you answer it, or maybe you hear a sound on the other end that sounds like you say hello, and it sounds like they answered. And then soon, you're talking about your car's extended warranty. (laughs) 
You're trapped in a conversation you never wanted to be a part of because you tarried, because you waited, because you stayed. You see, Solomon here is talking about the one who tarries. It's the one who doesn't start with the whole keg or a whole leader, but starts with a little bit, but then circles back and circles back and circles back and circles back. Earlier in Proverbs, Solomon warns of the sluggard, and he says, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. So too, the sluggard doesn't start going and just laying in a coma saying, don't come to me forever. (laughs) He starts with a little catnap, a little rest, and everything he desired is stripped from him. So too, those who tarry long over drink. It starts with a little, but it takes your life. Now here's where we need to be really sober in this point. Hopefully we are this morning. It's Sunday, it's 10 a.m. I mean sober in a mental sense here. Solomon doesn't answer his riddle saying, who has woe, who has strife, who has complaining, who has wounds without cause, who has redness of eyes, the drunkard. That would make sense. That is clear to us. But that's not what Solomon says, is it? Who is this person? It's simply the one who tarries. Solomon doesn't start with the intoxicated man. He starts by warning against the enchanted heart. He starts not by speaking to the drunkard, but by speaking to the one who is still sober and cautions how we look at alcohol. So how do we guard ourselves from this? If it could be us, how do we view this? Solomon answers this question by talking about our view in verses 31 and 32. Do not look at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. So what is Solomon saying here? He's forming our eyes to look properly on alcohol. There are houses for sale all over Missoula. And what happens is when you go into one, your eyes see many things, but when you're actually thinking about making an investment, there are things you want to see beyond the surface. And here he's saying when it comes to alcohol, do not consider it at its beginning when it sparkles in the cup and it spikes those taste buds and hits that dopamine in your mind. He says, look at it in light of the end. Look at where it leads. Its end is venom. It bites like a snake and kills all who it bites. And this is a really needed perspective for us today. Because our culture almost exclusively presents, I mean about the presentation of it, presents an assessment of alcohol, which is only the first part of verse 31. That is only its color, its sparkle, and its sweetness. I want you to think about this when you're watching TV or you're watching a sitcom, and I want you to notice how many times the writers rely on the main characters to be drunk in order for humor or adventure to follow, which first of all shows that they're not good writers. (laughs) Make a funny story. Think hard. But what we see is, I remember one show, and Sarah and I were talking, it's like every episode relies on this. It relies on inebriation for it to be silly and for it to be funny. We use phrases like hold my beer and liquid courage that we laugh at, but the point is that you are causing someone to be disassociated from what is reasonable and rational, and it is to be giggled at. It is to be laughed at. It implies that when we are drunk, we become funnier, stronger, braver, and more honest, but what is created in the sterile laboratory of TV and film is not representative of the reality of life in our world. In reality, 
compared to what is presented, in reality, alcohol abuse and drunkenness is devastating. It ruins families. It takes lives. It produces emotional, physical, and sexual abuse. And what is laughable on your favorite TV show is devastating when you see it in real life. In many ways, we numb ourselves to a pain that we should know is real in our world. I have good friends who won't touch alcohol because of the way way in which their parents harmed them when they were drunk. I've heard stories of people losing jobs and careers over a single foolish decision made while under the influence. I've encountered brilliant minds and great athletes who have lost scholarships, financial aid, and much of their future because of the sting of alcohol. I was talking with uh, one of our members who works at the fire department this week. He said, looking at the entire spectrum of homelessness in Missoula, and that includes the homeless people who are habitually homeless and you see them around town always, and even the broader homelessness things, the homelessness you don't see, the transitionary lives. He says about 60% of that entire population is enslaved to alcohol, which means this. We live in a city where homelessness is on the front page of almost every article we read. And we live in a place where you can be downtown and there can be portraits of the way in which alcohol ruins, destroys, and distorts. And yet on the other side of the wall are people drinking, thinking, this will never happen to me. But the Bible is not whitewashing the dangers of alcohol. In fact, earlier in Proverbs, Solomon tells us in a book whose goal we saw in Proverbs 1 is to make one wise. We see the disruptive force of this in Proverbs 20, verse 1, where Solomon says this, Wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler. Whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Actually, the Hebrew behind the is not wise, it's this probability cannot become wise, will not become wise. It's not that you aren't not wise in that moment and that's the end, but that a life committed to the brawler and the mocker of drink is a life which cannot earn wisdom. It's in light of this assessment where Solomon continues to show us how drunkenness is the anti-wisdom in the book of Proverbs. All of the good that Solomon as the father wants to give to his children is stripped away by abuses of alcohol. It is the opposite of God's good for us. And we see this in three scenes in verses 33 through 35. Read this with me. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. You will be like the one who lies down in the midst of the sea, like one who lies on the top of a mast. They struck me, you will say, but I was not hurt. They beat me but I did not feel it. When shall I awake? I must have another drink. A good friend of our church, Dr. Todd Miles, he's preached here before. He has a forthcoming book coming out on the Christian and marijuana. And while the high for marijuana and drunkenness are not one-to-one corollaries, part of his research was to look at all the Bible says about intoxicated and inebriated states. And he said there are three things the Bible presents that are always disrupted when one is under the influence of something that disassociates our mind and our bodies. And those three categories are our moral ability, our cognitive ability, and our physical ability. And we see all three of these in our text today. And all three of these things undo the work that Solomon as the loving father and God as the great wisdom wants us to understand. We see morally first in verse 33 that alcohol clouds our vision and causes our hearts to utter perverse things. If the standard of wisdom, which we looked at way back 31 weeks ago in Proverbs chapter 1, is that we would see the world through God's eyes, there is nothing silly about what is spoken in verse 33. 
when our eyes can no longer perceive reality. We see strange things. And when we see strange things, our vision is inverted. And what God sees as good, we see as boring, as dangerous, or as harmful. And what God sees as harmful and as a thief of joy, our confused eyes see as the promise of it. And what happens when our vision has been blurred, it creeps from our eyes to our hearts. And in that moment, what we see begins to be spoken. It says, your heart will utter perverse things. Now, this is a really important truth for us to understand. Think about times perhaps when you, Lord willing, have, it's been few, have been under the influence of alcohol. Think about friends or family you've encountered. Think about the guy yelling on the corner of Missoula streets on a Friday night. We often justify and write away the words and the actions of those who are inebriated as being something we could wipe away because you're under the influence. Yeah, he was just drunk. That's not who he was. It's not who he is. She would never say that if she were sober. But in the book of Proverbs, there is a word for lips. There's another Hebrew word that's used for mouths. And turns out, most times when we speak in the book of Proverbs, it's our lips or our mouth, which makes sense because that's where sound comes from. But Solomon doesn't use lips or mouth. He doesn't say when your eyes are confused, your lips will speak perverse things. He says when your eyes are confused, your heart will speak perverse things. In other words, all of the filth, all of the disgust, all of the garbage that comes out of a drunk person is actually a glimpse into who they really are in their heart. It's a glimpse to what is already there when it's sober. It exposes the worst of us and offers no hope. It's devastating. I was in seminary. I've seen pastors, church members fall in loving, good relationships who in a single night of tarrying too long slept with another person and lost their ministry, lost their family, and lost their kids. Alcohol reveals the brokenness of our hearts and itself offers no relief. If you want a window into to, to who you truly are, alcohol will give that to you. But what if I told you there's a better window Look with me at Hebrews chapter four. Verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and of the spirit, the joints and of the marrow, listen here, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart and no creature is hidden from its sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eye of him to whom we must give an account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. What's the distinction here? Both the word of God and drunkenness expose what's in our hearts. But here the word of God tells us where to go when we encounter the worst in our souls. We go to the high priest who is able to care for us, who is able to take our brokenness and the things we wish not to encounter and he bears them in his body on that tree so that we might be set free from it by the merits of our Savior, Jesus Christ. If you have things in your heart that you think alcohol numbs you to, here is the one who doesn't numb it, but takes the pain for you, who calls you to come to him, 
and to experience relief that alcohol promises but can never provide. Secondly, alcohol inhibits our cognitive ability. Solomon makes this point in uh, Proverbs 23, verse 34. He says, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, like one who, who lies on the top of a mast. And so in Proverbs, what do we see often? We see God made us to work. He warns against the sluggard. He wants good work. We saw this earlier in Proverbs 22, 29, that the one who is skilled in his work will not stand before obscure men, but he will stand before kings. Proverbs wants us to work well. But what does alcohol do to our cognitive abilities? It makes us unable to understand how we ought to respond. And he paints this humorous picture, if you think about it, with the sailor on a boat. So here you have a boat in the midst of a storm. And it's rocking and it's raging and the water is almost sweeping their feet out from under him. And if you were sober-minded and you were in the midst of a storm like this, what would the motion of the boat call you to do? Batten down the hatches, I don't know. (laughs) Do whatever you do on a boat to keep it from sinking, to grab the wheel, to to drop the sails. I don't know, something (laughs) helpful, something that contributes to not sinking. But what does the drunkard do with his cognitive ability so impaired? He says, oh, this is kind of like a lullaby. (laughs) This is rocking me to sleep. There's a little water on the deck. I'll go up on the mast and there I will sleep safely in the rocking of the boat that will take my life. Alcohol, when consumed to drunkenness, creates a people who cannot perceive how to act, which means they cannot love others and serve others as God designed or worship and serve the Lord as he desires. And lastly, we see alcohol affecting our physical ability. Verse 23, verse 35. They struck me, you will say, but I was not hurt. They beat me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake? I must have, says the comatose man, another drink. Here is a man so disoriented so inebriated that he cannot even tell who struck him. Violence and alcohol go hand in hand. It touches the lips like a lover, but bruises the belly like a brawler. And the word here that's used when it's talking about this beating is is actually a, a, a term used for blacksmiths of this hammering repeatedly. This man has not taken a casual passing blow as he sprained his ankle on the curb and fell over. This is a man who has been abused and violated by the vice of alcohol. And yet while he is still Still unconscious, all he wants to do is wake up in his bondage and have another drink. This makes for an excellent plot line in a sitcom. It makes for a terrible reality as a person created in the image of God. This is slavery. This is bondage. This is abuse. Drunkenness, a buzzed night on the town, a mom's night with a little too much wine matters to God. It dishonors him. It harms you and it affects others. And right now, this is the beauty of Proverbs. It is stinging us here in our sobriety to prevent us from death in our drunkenness. In fact, not only does Solomon warn against the physical, moral, and cognitive effects of this, but the Bible itself shows how drunkenness is not only out of place, but it is opposite to the fullness of wisdom. It is opposite to God's plans to save us. Look at how Paul speaks of this in Ephesians 5, and think of the context, think of the culture which is around the one filled with drunkenness in Proverbs 23. And now consider the culture around the one filled with something else in Ephesians chapter five. 
where Paul says this, beginning in verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Our mouths are freed, making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything in the name of God the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Christians are not meant to be controlled by alcohol, but by God's plan, we are controlled by the Holy Spirit. We are meant to be mastered, not by what destroys, but by what builds up, what undoes the woe, the sorrow, the grief, the wound, and the redness of eyes. Jesus has brought us redemption through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit to give us all that we long for in drunkenness that has been provided through Jesus. And this is where we need to see our second point today. And this is alcohol in the context of the gospel. So here we see Proverbs 23, a firm warning that is meant to dissuade you from drunkenness. It's meant to speak to the heart that tarries. But what does the Bible say about alcohol as a whole? Well, the first time we read about alcohol in Scripture, it comes on the tales of the flood. The earth was, was despairingly wicked, and so God judges the wicked and preserves Noah as this righteous remnant. And as soon as the metaphorical camera pans from the flood to Noah's family getting off the ark, what do we see? Noah, the hero, Naked, drunk, and making a fool of himself in his tent. Things aren't off to a great start with alcohol. And then the rest of the Old Testament progresses, and we read stories of Lot and his daughters and Judah and Tamar, and alcohol is used to deceive, to destroy, and to abuse. Which leaves us to wonder, can anyone use this safely? But then Jesus Christ the Messiah to whom the Old Testament points comes. And what's his first miracle? Turning water into wine. And not the boxed wine, the good stuff. The great wine, the delicious wine. And how did the Pharisees perceive Jesus? Jesus speaks, talking to the Pharisees about how he's perceived. And look at what he says in Luke chapter 7, verse 33 and 35. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man, that is Jesus, has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by all her children. What's the point here? The Pharisees see Jesus as one who comes eating and drinking. And why is that good news for us? Because Jesus was not the drunkard. Jesus was not the glutton. Here finally is the true man of wisdom, wisdom incarnate, who sees the good gift that God has given and is able to enjoy it to the glory of God without sin, who is able to live in wonderful obedience to the God who gave. You're part of the wild thing about alcohol is if you were to put up what the Bible says about pros and cons of drinking, the cons are giant. <laughs> they are massive. We're much more warned of alcohol than we are encouraged to consume it. And yet, alcohol is part of God's covenant sign of blessing to his people. When God was bringing Israel into the promised land, he spoke of Israel as his vineyard would produce choice wine. When Israel's sin and rebellion caused God to judge them, the metaphor he used is that your vine was going to be destroyed. Your vats are going to be emptied. Your wine is going to be taken away. Your cause for celebration is going to be removed. But then in the promises and the prophecies of this new covenant where the story of God is a story of a God who moves towards people who have rebelled against him because of his covenant with them, he says, I will replant your vineyards. I will give you celebration and your vats of wine will be full. More than this, the same Jesus who came eating and drinking without sin gave to the church the Lord's Supper, which at the center of it is the cup of wine. Wine which is meant not to draw us into itself, but to point us to Christ Christ 
in his future cup. A cup that Jesus himself says he is abstaining from. He is practicing self-discipline, saying no to this until we drink it with him anew in the new heavens, in the new earth. This is Luke 22, verses 14 through 20. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he took a cup, he had given thanks and said, take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, he took the cup after they had eaten and said, this cup is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. More than simply drinking or not drinking, God wants Christians to think Christianly about our drinking, about wine and beer, because the promise of the cup of Christ is part of God's redemptive covenant for his people. And there are two sins which are generally common to every culture everywhere. And those are sins of of sexual excess and alcoholic excess. And most cultures have this love-hate relationship with them where they want it, they desire it, and yet they understand the guilt and the problem of the vice that is. And they wrestle with what do boundaries look like when we want to be unbounded with this. What can we do when we're drunk? What are safe grounds for sexuality? Because we want it all, but we realize at the same time this comes with massive problems. And yet, in both the fruit of the vine and in the union of sex are two neon signs of God's covenant love for us. Sex is meant to give us an experience of what Christ's love for the church is like. Wine is meant to give us a taste of what that celebration will be when finally free from sinning, we stand with Jesus Christ in a new kingdom. Could it be that when it comes to issues of sex and drunkenness, it's not that our desires, to paraphrase C.S. Lewis, are too much, but too little? Our problem isn't that these two issues are too far from our redemption, but they're too close. They are the signs which we get so close to that speak to the felt needs of our heart for relief and for intimacy that are meant to point us to Jesus, but apart from his work, we get caught up at the sign and neglect of the substance. We only find our fill not in the gluttonous table of the world, but when we come to the table of Jesus Christ. We only satisfy our longings for intimacy when we are united with Jesus in his church as his true bride. We only celebrate ultimately and freely the relief of all of our baggage when we sit with Christ with the cup of the wedding supper of the lamb, the cup poured out for our sin. It is here in Jesus Christ where our desires for relief and intimacy are fulfilled, not in the excessive use of the sign, but in submission to the substance. Jesus Christ, the true bridegroom and the true bride for those who long for the signs, come to the source. Come and be filled. Give it up in excess and realize that Christ has provided excessively for you, that his cup does not sting like the world's cup. His cup is not venom that leads to death, but it is repentance that leads to life. His covenant, it was what brings us in to the presence of God where we are finally filled and inebriated, not with what damages, but with the Holy Spirit which gives life and breath to our being. And when we have that, we can turn, we can begin to look at our view of alcohol. Our eyes are trained to not see it in gospel absent absolutes, but in wise submission to whatever honors the Lord and serves the church. And this is our last point today, by way of application, alcohol in the context of the church. So what have we seen so far in scripture? We've seen that scripture heartily warns against alcohol. 
And yet scripture places no blanket prohibition on the consumption of alcohol. So what do we do? We live in a church where there are some people who fall in different places on this. Well, here's four principles that should shape our response as a church. And first is, even though we see alcohol warned against, but alcohol never out of hand prohibited, that what is prohibited is drunkenness. First, we realize that drunkenness has no place in the Lord's church. Look at how the Apostle Paul speaks of this in 1 Corinthians 5, 11 through 13. But now I'm writing you, that's to the church, not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. If he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. You, church, purge the evil person from among you. Why is drunkenness, or here we see unrepentant drunkenness being part of what Paul calls the church to exercise church discipline over? If there is someone who's a believer who is controlled by this, the church needs to respond. God says, you are responsible to warn that person that this is not Christian, that you cannot serve Christ and the cup of wine. Why is that? Look at what he says shortly after on the same page probably for you in chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? What is at stake? The kingdom cup, the thing behind the sign, the substance which finally satisfies. And yet here we see these are those who will not get there. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkard, nor reviler, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That's bad news for almost all of us. But here's the good news. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. Paul wants you to have a keen awareness of this because he wants you to have all of the fruit of redemption in your life. He wants you not to be slaves to alcohol because he wants you to be a slave to Jesus. But here Paul gives hope, hope to those who find themselves in any of those qualifiers on that list, that there is one who washes, there is one who cleans, there is one who regenerates. And that is Jesus, the king who came to die for you. If you wrestle with alcohol like this, if you see people who wrestle like this, you know the feelings of bondage that accompany this. And yet there is a washing that cleanses. There is hope for you to come and bring this out of the dark and to bring it into the light of Christ. You see, we often think that alcohol is like a truth serum that looses our lips to confess what we really wrestle with. But I can promise you the gospel is a better truth serum because it's the grace of Christ which allows us to freely share what we struggle with and to get help from Jesus who has come to save us. You see, if we want to be a church that has a biblical view of alcohol, we need to be a church that first has a biblical view of honesty, that soberly realizes we can bring this into the light of Christ and discipleship is the place where we can have loose lips as if we were inebriated by wine, but inebriated by the spirit to say, this is where I am and this is where I need help. What drunkenness shows in our desire for it as a culture is that we actually desire honesty and intimacy. But those two things with the world cannot solve your problem of sin, but Jesus can. And so a church that is focused on bringing these into the light and having these honest discussions, as awkward and as difficult as it is, is a church where the light of Christ chases out the darkness of drunkenness. And the end is not sorrow waking up in a stupor saying, when can I have another drink? The end is the light of Christ which shines on those who are dead and causes us to rejoice. Second, the enjoyment of alcohol points us towards Christ and not away from it. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 22? He has abstained from wine until we come to him. In the meantime, 
While Jesus has abstained from it, he hasn't given a blanket prohibition to the church to abstain from it. Which means, though, as we enjoy alcohol responsibly, if we don't want to stare at the color and be bamboozled as we tarry, as Solomon talked about, instead, as we take the cup, we stare at the Savior. Look at Psalm 104, verses 14 through 15. Speaking to God here, you cause grass to grow for livestock and the plants for man to cultivate that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine and bread to strengthen man's heart. How do we not abuse alcohol? We pull Jesus into it with us. You see, God gave us alcohol as he gave us sex, as he gave us food, and that is to draw us closer towards him, not further from him. And so as we live in a culture that has a brewery vibe and your community groups might have nights that meet there in sensitive ways, we need to be mindful that we as Christians, even if we feel wise enough to drink, we drink for the glory of the Lord. That when we take that first drink, we say, this is a reminder of the celebration I will have with Jesus by his blood. This is what Jesus is calling me towards. And I can bet that the more you focus on the source of your celebration being Christ, the less inclined you will be to even flirt with the edge of drunkenness and tearing over wine. How much more enjoyment do we have when we get to enjoy both the sign and the substance in Jesus Christ? Enjoyment of alcohol points us towards Christ, not away from it. Third, don't look for the sign to provide the relief of the Savior. If Christians do drink, they should not drink alcohol in order for the alcohol to provide them relief. Jesus brings us relief. If after a long day at work or a long day with the kids, the one thing that's on your mind is I need a drink, that means you don't need a drink. Because here's the reality. Alcohol doesn't bring us peace. Jesus does. Alcohol doesn't promise to carry your burdens. Jesus does. Alcohol doesn't help you cope. Jesus deals with it. Alcohol doesn't take away the burden of sins and anxieties. It masks it for a moment while the ball gets bigger and bigger. But Jesus does. Find your relief in Jesus. If you don't know what that looks like, talk about your desire with alcohol, with your roommate or a community group leader, or an elder in the church. Think about ways where you might be looking to the sign to bring what only the Savior can bring and know the Savior gives it better, abundantly, and freely. Lastly, don't cause others to sin. For many good reasons, there are some Christians who don't drink. There are some believers who have been harmed by alcohol and don't want to harm others. There are some Christians who have been held captive to alcohol and know that were it there, they would tarry. And yet... I find that when we encounter Christians, and in, in, speaking of this church, I think it's different in different churches, in this church we have a tendency to assume that those who abstain from alcohol are prudish and don't realize the freedom we have in the new covenant. But we don't ever think those same thoughts about Paul, who in Corinthians says, I wish it were that you wouldn't marry. That you would live your life without the bonds of marriage, and serve Jesus with an undivided heart. If Paul can say to the believers in Corinth that he wishes some would abstain from marriage for the glory of God, can we not also freely celebrate those who wish to abstain from alcohol for the glory of God? Instead of saying, no one says like, oh man, you want to be single? You should try sex, it's great. We were free in the new covenant to marry and have sex. But so many times, we find the person who in looking at their conscience and trying to please God chooses to abstain and we're often like, there's freedom here, man. Instead, we support them. We encourage them. We care for the weaker brother by even guarding our actions and our drinking around them. Which means that when your community groups go to breweries, you should know your community group and know the people who are there and think, is this wise and loving? And for those who do abstain, the Bible calls us to not look judgmentally on those who in Christian liberty do drink alcohol as Christ would allow it. And Paul says to both those who wrestle over abstaining and those who wrestle over participating, wrestles them to think this way in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 31 through the first verse of chapter 11. 
So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, why is he pleasing? That's the key thing. Now he's going to respond to that. Not seeking my, seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Right now, how is it that your view of alcohol imitates that of our Savior? For those who abstain, do you abstain like Jesus is? Not woefully, not longingly, not judgmentally, but knowing that they do so with no lack, that one day the cup that Christ gives to us in the new kingdom is the cup which satisfies us and says, that wasn't even the good stuff. This is the good stuff. You can imitate Christ in your waiting. For those who do consume, do you imitate Christ? Does your drinking give no affront to sin? Does it represent the warnings and the dangers which Jesus gives, but tries to, as Jesus does, enjoy this gift, not in and of itself, but as a gift from God, which is tied to our redemption? You see, the truth is, is your view of alcohol, when it comes to how your neighbor perceives your conservative, evangelical, baptistic church who's preaching on alcohol, is what's up for grabs is actually the witness of Jesus Christ. And there are ways where the gospel shapes what we consume and what we don't so that others might see the Savior who has come to satisfy and satisfy abundantly. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pray that you give our church wisdom, that in giving us eyes to see into the looking glass of the drunkard, you've given us eyes to see into the cup of Christ. And so, Lord, I pray today that soberly we stand warned. We stand so warned so that we will refuse to move towards this discussion without holding Christ near to us. Lord, we pray for our own hearts. We're either in abstaining or in participating. Perhaps we have done so apart from your word. So Lord, curb our hearts to you. Make us imitators of Christ as new covenant believers who share in the cup of Christ. I pray that our church will be a unique witness in a city that loves breweries. That when we enjoy, we enjoy to the glory of the Lord. That when we abstain, we abstain to the glory of the Lord. So that through any means, all might be saved. We pray this in your name. Amen.